Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nir Vishesha Sunyavari Pasyatya De Sitarine Maum Vishnu Padai Krishna Pista Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Tinamine Sri Varshivana Videvi Daite Kripabdaya Krishna Sambandha Vigyanam Dayane Pabave Namaha, Madur Ojwala Prema Dya, Sri Rupa Nuga Bhakti Da, Sri Golda Kuruna Shakti Big Rahayana Mostate Namaste, Godavani, Sri Murtaye Dinatane, Rupa Nuga, Guru Rapa, Siddhanta Dwanta Harinai, Namo Golda Kishodaya Saksad Bhairagya, Murtaya, Vipalamba Sambode, Udambu Jayate Namaha, Namo Bhakti Vinodaya Satchidananda Namine Gauda Shakti Varu Sarupaya Rupanuga Varayate Gauda Bhibhava Bhumes Tvam Nir Disesa Sajanapriyam Vaishnava Sarvabhoma Sri Jagannatayate Namaha Panchakalpataru Vesja Kripa Sindhu Peva Chapatitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitana Guna Thalanda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaura Vakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So according to the calendar today is the disappearance day of Srila Bhakti Vinoda Kaur along with the disappearance day of Sri Gadadhar Pandit. So we have been instructed to fast half a day. And today in honor of the disappearance of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So I'll speak a little bit about both, but I'll begin by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Uh, his life is quite uh, variegated, full of uh, contributions to Lord Chaitanya's movement. Many, many, many outstanding books, periodicals, and of course, he was the vanguard, we call him the vanguard of Lord Chaitanya's movement in the West. It was Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur who actually discovered the actual birth site of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. There was some misunderstanding or also some controversy about the actual appearance play of place of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And a particular place was known, but it was doubted by many without any real evidence to the contrary. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur went into a great study of many of the available maps that were there at the time. And through his study, he felt he had located the actual birth site of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The site that he had designated through his research, he found there was a profuse amount of Tulsi leaves, I'm sorry, Tulsi plants, growing in a very huge mound in a certain area, which he felt was the birthplace. And after confirming it with others and excavating the place, they also found artifacts such as a deity of baby Lord Chaitanya 
and other interesting articles. Also, there was also another Didi found, a Vishnu Didi. Um, that birthplace now is designated as in just down the road from our Sri Mayapur Mandir. It is known as Yoga Peet. It is a grand complex and on the outskirts of the complex, or you might say within the immediate confines of the complex, there is a temple dedicated to Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, it is mentioned that one day he was contemplating the Lord Chaitanya's appearance in the world. And in the, while he was contemplating, he was looking out in that same direction where later on it was discovered that this was the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. He had a vision, not a dream, not an illusion, but a vision. And then that vision, he saw people from all of the five races in the world the black race, the brown race, the yellow race, the white race, the red race, all five races of the world, dancing together, chanting Jai Sachinandana, Jai Sachinandana, Jai Sachinandana. Based on that vision, he could understand that soon a great personality would appear in the world and would take Lord Chaitanya's teachings and mission and bring it around the world. And this was also prophesized in a particular verse, which is now part of Chaitanya Charitamrita, that uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement will go to every town and village. When the verse was first discovered, it was interpreted that, that every town and village meant India. But later on, we understood it didn't, as our, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada proved that Lord Chaitanya's movement was meant for the whole world, not just for a small tract of land in one area of the world. In 1896, which is the exact same year as the appearance of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, Bhaktivedanta Thakur had completed one book, Teachings and Precepts of Lord Chaitanya, a small book, about 100 pages, small size book, and he made many copies in English. And he sent those copies to many of the major universities, universities around the world. Oxford in England, uh, Leipzig in Germany, McGill University in Canada, and later on, when, when Srila Prabhupada's devotees were putting Prabhupada's books in many universities, they came to McGill University and found that book. <laughs> By accident, they had discovered it. And then they showed it to Srila Prabhupada. And uh, this was quite prophetic because the same year that the book went around the world, the person who would take the teachings of Lord Chaitanya appeared in the world. And that was, of course, his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. And of course, Bhakti Thakur could understand that soon, of course, not in his lifetime, but soon, this would be a reality. And we're seeing it now. Bhakti Vinod Thakur's vision 
and the prophecy from the verse and Srila Prabhupada's appearance in the world. And the results of that appearance is that Lord Chaitanya's teachings are being not only being philosophically read and studied, but practiced in a very direct way in the process of pure devotional service as given by Sri Krishna in Srimad Bhagavatam and explained in, in further in Chaitanya, Sri Chaitanya Chari Tamrita. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was very active. He was a family man. Not only a family man, but he had a very large family. In two different accounts, it says that one account says he had 10 children. Another account said he had 13 children. But in either case, he had many children in a big family. And of course, the fifth son of Bhakti Vinod Thakur was Bhimala Prashad, who was later known as Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And he appeared in Jagannath Puri at the same time when Bhakti Vinod Thakur was the in charge of the Jagannath temple to make sure that all the activities of the Jagannath temple went on according to this to the desired schedule that was initiated for the worship of Jagannath which is a very very big big project uh, he also went around door to door collecting funds in order to support the worship of Lord Jagannath in the temple when the temple was in dire economic straits, not having enough money. And by his uh, door to door soliciting of funds, he connected, he, he collected enough money to bring the worship back of Jagannath to a very high standard. Mm -hmm. Bhakti Vinod Thakur wrote many, many books. And Srila Prabhupada also gave credence or gave permission to us devotees in the ISKCON movement that we should read Bhakti Vinod Thakur's books. He never said that about any other chari, including his own spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. But he did say about because Bhakti Vinod Thakur had bridged the gap between East and West in his writings. In the, the early part of the, or next day, when the middle part of the 1800s, he was involved with a few groups. Um, I forgot the name of the group, the Bhadra Club, I think they were called. And they were studying Western theologians who were transcendentalists, such as Ralph Walder Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and others who were coming from the Western countries who had written about transcendence, which was very rare in those days. Um, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur grew up as a Shakta. He was a Shakta worship, the worship of the energy, the female energy of the Lord Durga Devi. But in one part in his life, he came across the manuscript, which was a, a very interesting manuscript, a rare manuscript, which described the life and teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It was in Bengal. And he took that, he read it many times, and then he was convinced that this was the real truth that he was looking for all his life. He gave up his focus on Shakta and became a Vaishnava and then started to write many, many books. Also gave lectures, wrote periodicals and um, performed so many devotional activities in order to proliferate the entire process of, of Lord Chaitanya's teachings in the world. 
which had been lost, this is the most in, important point, for 150 years after the departure of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there was a complete blackout of the knowledge of Lord Chaitanya. And this is related to one particular pastime with Vamanadev in, uh, in Bali Maharaj that goes back millions and millions of years ago. There was a curse that at a, at a certain time, Lord Chaitanya's movement would be lost for a period of time, but then brought back by a great personality who later out turned out to be Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur in 1869 spoke once a very powerful speech called the, the Bhagavat. Uh, this particular uh, speech was later transcribed into a little pamphlet and distributed as the Bhagavat. And what he did, there was a lot of confusion, wrong interpretations uh, about Srimad Bhagavatam. People had their own ideas, even scholars, other literary men had their own ideas or even spiritualists about what is Srimad Bhagavatam. The Bhakti Vinoda core understanding, after understanding Lord Chaitanya's movement, and understanding that Lord Chaitanya came to teach the message of Srimad Bhagavatam in the form of his particular life. Then he, he connected that all together. And in that speech, he very carefully, it's the most interesting speech. The wording is, it keeps you captivated as you read it uh, line by line. It's published in a small pamphlet called the Bhagavad. And that helped to again, bring about a clear and correct understanding of what Srimad Bhagavatam was. He also wrote Krishna Samhita, which was a chapter by chapter explanation of Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, the famous book that Srila Prabhupada encouraged us to write was Jaiva Dharma, a very lengthy book about the entire science in detail of the process of pure devotional service given it to in a narrative form where it's explained between a life of a guru and a disciple and the discussion between guru and disciple and how it plays out in different uh, levels of understanding the process of bhakti as it goes from the very simple and basic as it goes to higher, higher levels, destroying or exposing all the false sense of what real devotional is, devotion is, as it comes to the highest level of prema bhakti, and then within the prema bhakti, goes into the entire process of prema bhakti in all its detail. It's a most interesting read. I think I read it twice. Uh, Srila Prabhupada has recommended. You might say it's Rupa Goswami's nectar of devotion expounded uh, into more and more detailed understanding of the science of pure devotional service. And what makes it interesting, it's a narrative. So it keeps you captivated in a story-like setting of the knowledge that is being given chapter by chapter. And it's quite a lengthy book, five or 600 pages maybe, or maybe even more, but it's the most interesting read. Uh, we would stop here just to say, uh, we would highly recommend the devotees to read this book, Jaiva Dharma. It was published by the Gaudiya Math and then it was republished by ISKCON. Again, uh, the ISKCON version is very easier to read and complete in itself. 
Um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur also penned another book called Chaitanya Shikshamrita, where he again expounds it on the process of pure devotional service, goes into the whole process of Krishna and Vrindavan, and the different demons representing the different anarthas in devotional service, along with giving foundational principles, which are very important for, for especially for Grihastas, on how to successfully execute devotional service in the Grihasta ashram. That is Chaitanya Shikshamrita. Uh, that book also was mentioned by Srila Prabhupada, our Guru Maharaj, as a recommended read for devotees in the ISKCON society. Those two books particularly he emphasized, but then he said, you should read all the books of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And of course, he read, he wrote over a hundred books, periodicals, essays, and various other forms of uh, smaller articles that were published. Um, he also wrote one book called Devadatta, which is a life of a person uh, learning about devotional service. It's a novel. It's a, it's a novel. It's an interesting novel. So he wrote one novel, I think maybe even two novels, another one called P.O.D. P.O.R.D. P.R. Day is another novel that he wrote. And of course, he also wrote some books in Bengali and another and uh, and uh, also gave many, many lectures. In the year, just a few years before his departure in the year 1911, he was at loggerheads with the Brahmins, the Brahmins in the area, particularly those who are known as Smarta Brahmanas, that means the ritualistic Brahmins, not necessarily those who are fixed in Brahminical culture, but have birth by Brahmin caste. Uh, they were challenging Vaishnavism, as was given by the Vaishnavas at the time in saying Brahmanism is the highest form of practice of spirituality, the principles of Brahmanism. Bhakti Thakur was scheduled in a place called Midnapur, somewhere in Bengal, to appear for a debate with some of the leading Brahmins based on the principle of Vaishnava and Brahmanism Bhakti Vinoda Akur, his son, of course, was Bhakti, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, uh, Sri Varshabhanavi Devi. He had received initiation at that time. He had studied the works of his father and also of Brahmanism, and he wrote extensively on the topic. When it was time for Bhakti Vinod Thakur to go to the debate, unfortunately, he got rheumatic fever and was bedridden and could not go. But then his son, Bhakti Siddhanta, came forward, explaining to his father that he had written about it and he was fully ready to take his place in the debate. Bhakti Vinod Thakur was happy and Bhakti Siddhanta went. It was a great debate. And uh, it was proven that Vaishnavism is superior to all other forms of spiritual practice, and especially Brahmanism in this particular case. And that particular event established the reputation of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati as a foremost proponent of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And then of course, that led to his developing his entire spiritual career, following in the footsteps of his father by writing many books, opening temples and spreading Lord Chaitanya's movement on, throughout the entire subcontinent of India. 
Uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur um, was a magistrate. Um, he worked for the British Raj. He was respected amongst the British Raj as one of their best magistrates. He was very expert at doing his service. Um, when it was time to come for a case to be heard before Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Normally cases would take so many days, but Bhakti Vinod Thakur, when he would sit over a particular case to make a judgment, he was very expert at understanding the dynamics of the whole situation after hearing the arguments. And he would make very quick, but very expert decisions, which moved things along very nicely. The British were very much appreciated of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and they arranged for a railroad car to be attached to the rail, the train that Bhakti Vinod Thakur used to take every day to go to work. They gave him his own special railroad car, which was attached to the other, to the train. So he had his own private compartment and train so he could read and study while he was going back and forth to work. Um, there is some publication of his actual schedule. Um, this, his schedule was quite interesting. He was very similar to Srila Prabhupada's schedule. He would take rest a little bit earlier than Prabhupada did. He would take rest 8.30 every night and he'd wake up around midnight and then from there he would write and also practice his own sadhana. He maintained his family, big family, nicely. There was no lack in taking care of the family because his presence was so powerful that whatever time that he gave to the family was very satisfying to all the family members. Um, there was one particular incident which heralds his spiritual power. His Holiness uh, Bhakti Churu Maharaj has written a series on the life of Srila Prabhupada. And in one of the episodes, it's a movie, a video episode. Each, each of the videos is about an hour plus long. I think it's the fourth or fifth video illustrates this one pastime in the life of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Where at that one, at that time, when Bhakti Vinod Thakur was a magistrate, there was one so-called yogi. His name was Bishikasena. And he had gotten involved with politics. But at the same time, he had declared himself an incarnation of Mahavishnu, and he had come to remove the British from India. And he had some spot power. He had mystic power. And he would give speeches and track thousands of people. But he was also quite licentious in his behavior that he would meet young girls in villages at night and perform Rasalila saying that he was Mahavishnu who also is non-different than Lord Krishna and so he could also perform Rasalila. So this was causing a great disturbance all over and of course the British were becoming quite concerned about this person so they gave the case to Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Bhakti Vinod Thakur made it a point to meet this person, Vishikashena. And uh, they spoke. And Vishikashena, uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur actually said that, you know, that the, you should actually worship the real, the, the actual Supreme Personality of Godhead who was appeared in Jagannath Puri as Lord Jagannath. He is Krishna himself. But Vishikashena was told that, Vishikashena responded, yes, he is the Supreme Lord, stationary, but I am the Supreme Lord moving. 
So I am non-different than Jagannath. <laughs> when Bhakti Vinod Hakur heard, heard this blasphemy by Bishri Kishenam, he had the power of the British Raj behind him. He became angry when this so-called yogi offended the Lord. And so he called the constables and had this man put in jail. Now, when he was put in jail, he became angry at Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So using his mystic power, he caused the entire family of Bhakti Vinod Thakur to, come, to become sick with very high fever, including Bhakti Vinod Thakur. His wife, Bhagavati Devi, was quite sick and she was also suffering. And she said to her husband, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, we should let him go or we will all die. Bhakti Vinod Thakur's response was interesting. He said, we can all die, but this rascal would not, will not be freed. And so, of course, the fevers remained and people were quite sick. And then one person who knew a little bit about Bishi Kishena, because Bishi Kishena had long matted locks of hair. And he came to Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He said, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, his power is in his hair. So when Bhakti Vinod Thakur heard that, he called a barber and they forcibly shaved him up. <laughs> he got initiated. And uh, his hair, they, they cut off all his hair. And then about three days later, he died in jail. And of course, when he died, everybody was freed from the curse of the disease. So that was a um, interesting fight between Bhakti Vinod Thakur and this presumptuous yogi who claimed to be Mahavishnu. Uh, that's nicely illustrated in video form by uh, Bhakti Chiru Swami Maharaj in the, the series called Abhay Charan, which is a series of videos on the life of uh, Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. um, for us in ISKCON society, Bhakti Vinod Thakur has given us many things that we engage in daily in worship. Uh, the Gorarti song, Kibajayo, Jaya Gauda Chanda, Arotike Soba, was written by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur in glorification of Lord Chaitanya when he was surrounded by all his disciples worshiping Lord Chaitanya in a very beautiful archi that was performed in Srivas Anga during the time of Lord Chaitanya's appearance. From that particular pastime, this song was developed. Kivajayo jaya gora chande arutike one of the most beautiful glorifications, now a regular feature of the ISKCON Society for the Gorarchi in every temple around the world. He also, uh, we adopted also his prayer for honoring Prashadam. Sarira vijajal jatendriya jahe tehe kaho jive fele visayur sagare was written by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, including part two, which we don't sing for our prayers. Ek dina shanti pore. It starts off like that, glorifying how the devotees came together at the house of Advaita Charya to honor Krishna Prashadam. A beautiful, beautiful rendition. Both parts were penned by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. We sing the first part. Also, before every class, we sing uh, uh, Jai Radha Madhava, Kunja Vihari, Gopi Janavalava Giri Vadadari, Yasoda Nandana, Raja Jana Ranjana, Jamuna Tiravana Chari. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, in commenting on this prayer by Bhakti Vinod uh, Thakur, said, 
this particular prayer is the ideal picture of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Jaya Radha Madhava, Kunja Bihari, Gopi Janavalava, Giri Vadadari, Yasoda Nandana, Braja Janaranjana, Jamuna Tira Vanachari, illustrating Srila Prabh uh, Krishna's pastimes in Sri Vrindavan Dham in such a beautiful way. So these are some of the daily uh, songs and prayers that we recite in our temples all around the world, uh, given to us by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. There is a beautiful book written by one Prabhupada disciple Rupa Vilas called The Seventh Goswami. It's a biography of the life of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. There's another one called uh, Hinduism Meets Modernity by Sukhavak Prabhu. And uh, uh, that was written maybe about 25, 30 years ago, no, even earlier. That was the second uh, biography of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, which is a little bit more detailed in the life of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So um, this great personality is called the father of Lord Chaitanya's movement in the Western world. It was by his vision and also his prophecy, which uh, mentioned that soon a great personality will appear and take Lord Chaitanya's message to every town and village. It was Bhakti Vinod Thakur's determined effort to bring Lord Chaitanya's movement back in a very powerful way and at the same time prophesize the future as Lord Chaitanya's movement would unfold and eventually come to the appearance of Srila Prabhupada in the United States of America in 1965. All this is the orchestration of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. All of these great personalities are Lord Chaitanya's messengers in the world to bring about his appearance into the world and the institution or the, inst the initiation of the Yuga Dharma, which is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we have so much uh, to be appreciative towards Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He has given so much. It's not possible to exhaust all the material he has given us. It's a, it's a huge library of Gaudiya Vaishnav philosophical and spiritual teachings, mostly centered around the, the uh, life and teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So I would, again, just to repeat, I would highly recommend you read Jaiva Dharma and Chaitanya Shikshamrita, especially out of the two, Jaiva Dharma. Anyone who, who wants to know what is the science of pure devotional service, that book will answer all your questions and give you a clear and complete picture of what is bhakti, pure devotional service, in detail. <laughs> okay, so today is his disappearance day. And for those of you who are in the early morning hours yet, uh, it's a fast day today. <laughs> and uh, for those of us who are a little later in the day here in the Europe, We've already gone through that part of the day, but today is a wonder, is an important day to remember and honor and glorify Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Uh, today also, just to mention, we don't have a lot of time, is in fact, maybe what I'll do is I'll speak about Gadadhar Pandit tomorrow as part of tomorrow's class. I'll focus because I don't want to minimize his, his importance. He is one of the Panchatattva Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda. 
Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivas Vigor Bhaktivinda. He's an incarnation of Srimati Radharani, who, with an element of Lalita Sakhi, has appeared to assist Lord Chaitanya in his, in his movement of spreading Krishna consciousness in the area of Navadvip and in the area of, especially in the area of Jagannath Puri. So just a brief mention of Gadadhar Pandit for today. And tomorrow we'll go into more detail in the life of Gadadhar Pandit. It's also very, very interesting. He is non-different than Srimati Radharani, appearing as Gadadhar Pandit, a very sweet and intimate associate of, um, of Lord Chaitanya. There is in the yoga pit himself, in, that, in the area of the yoga pit, in the back part, there's a particular temple. There was two deities installed by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur and worshipped by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. They are Gorgadadhar deities. Uh, you'll see Lord Chaitanya is on the, the left as you face, and Gadadhar is on the right. And these two deities. Uh, tomorrow, I'll show you the picture of these two deities as part of tomorrow's presentation. Um, these deities are worshipped in the mood of Madhurya Ras, where we worship Gornitai in the mood of Sakya Ras. Uh, Gorgadadhar is in the mood of Madhurya Ras, a very interesting manifestation of the worship of Madhurya Ras as illustrated by Sri Chaitanya, a very intimate and very and a very less talked about aspect of Lord Chaitanya's life, Gorgadadhar worship. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll stop there because our time is limited. So. Uh, Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for the wonderful class. Um, I request devotees if they have any questions or comments or realizations, they can go ahead. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my most humble obeisances. All glories to you, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, Guru Maharaj, I enjoyed that story about um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta and the curse that that yogi had put on him and his family while he was in jail. And I was just wondering um, how Krishna can allow such a curse to affect such a pure devotee. Well, you can look at it from different angles of vision. Um, you can say that, you know, people who have such power, they, they can use that power in an influential way. You'll see, if when you see the video, uh, as illustrated by Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj, when he presents this story, that particular section of the, uh, of the Leela is quite interesting. Because Bhakti Vinod Thakur is performing yagyas. And he's also undergoing attacks at the same time from this yogi. And you see how he's warding off the effects of the attack by performing various types of yagyas. Um, the other thing is you could, and this wouldn't be out, outline of, outside of the line of our, our protocol for understanding how Krishna works and that is a lot of times the Lord likes to glorify his devotees by putting them in a difficult situation just to show the uh, foundation of the fabric of their bhakti. That despite whatever difficulties they're undergoing, it doesn't deter from their devotional service. And of course, as, as the story is being narrated, you'll see that there's a great determination by Bhakti Vinoda Kaur not to give in and he was requested not only by his family members, but others that unless you, you know, give in, uh, you're going to die. <laughs> uh, but 
he was so adamant that such a personality should not be given any kind of, you know, leadway because they're polluting the entire principles of devotional service. This pretentiousness taking the position of Krishna, which is very much common in, especially in the, in the subcontinent of India, there's so many yogis and sadhus, tapasyas, who claim to be the Supreme Lord or some incarnation of the Supreme Lord. Bhakti Thakur wanted to rid this idea and set the precedent that, you know, unless you're mentioned in the Shastras, which you, you're not, <laughs> you are not given that, you know, title. So why didn't Krishna protect him? I think he did. <laughs> you see how the, the, the story plays itself out, but there was a great fight in between. <laughs> Uh, the power that that yogi had was enough to kill. But I, the way it's presented is that Bhakti Vinod Thakur's own spiritual power was strong enough to resist the attempts by this yogi to kill him, which came out in the form of simply a high fever. That's clear in the narration of the story that the yogi wasn't just trying to give him a, a fever, he was trying to kill him. And he had powers, there's no question about it. But Bhakti Vinod Thakur was also spiritually powerful and he was able to resist the attacks by this yogi. I think this example is there throughout the history of Gaudiya Vaishnava is that devotees find themselves under attack from either demons or various types of materialistic forces and have to go undergo some difficulties. We look what Srila Prabhupada had to go through in order to establish the, the Juhu temple in Bombay. Such difficulties to fight this, this uh, Mr. Nair, who was trying to cheat them, the devotees in so many different ways, using very kind, very kind of conspiratorial ideas to uh, make the devotees look like that they were cheaters and that they were trying to cheat him out of the land. He turned it completely around, but, but, but Prabhupada fought him head on. There's an idea and that, that the whole story has now been released in a book by Giriraj Swami called uh, May I Build You a Temple. It's just been released, I think within the last month or two. It's a large account. I think Giriraj Swami who was right there during the time uh, for, has gathered all the information and has been working on this book for years. And now it's out. So you see that when you try to spread devotional service in the world, you know, there's always going to be opposition on a, what you say, on a, uh, on an administration level and on an individual level, or I say on an organizational level or on an, an individual level. Prabhupada says, the more powerful you become in Krishna consciousness, the more you will bring about enemies. Because there are demons, there are envious people, there are even people within the spiritual uh, societies who are envious of others when they have success in spiritual life. So this is the way of the world. And there are many, many conflicts. Even now, there are people who are trying to stop our movement using various types of 
subtle forms of uh, energies to cripple our movement, but they can't touch us as long as we stay strict in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. As soon as we lose that, then we are victimized by these attacks coming from the various four sources. It's not something I'm just imagining. There are many accounts uh, that can validate what I'm saying because it's a fact that this movement is meant to spread around the world. And there are those who know about that and are willing to doing anything they can to somehow or other stop this movement. They tried that through court cases, through legal cases, various types of other means to, to stop our movement. But Lord Chaitanya's movement cannot be stopped. <laughs> but there will be resistance. There will be difficulties. Sometimes there'll even be setbacks. That's just the way it is in this. And Krishna is there to protect. There's no doubt about that. So in this particular case for Bhakti Vinod Thakur, uh, no doubt this yogi was so powerful that he could kill Bhakti Vinod Thakur and his family. But by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur's own spiritual prowess, he was able to resist that. And it came out in the form of a, uh, a fever, high fever, of course. He, he was actually bedridden for some time because of that. But this is the way it is, you know, this is the material world. So you can see how Krishna protected his pure devotee, no doubt, and gave him victory in the end. Hare Krishna Mark, can I ask a question? Yes, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. So Mark, so this is today's the disappearance day of Bhakti Notaku, and you've spoken a, you've spoken about Bhakti Notaku. Could you speak a little bit on the principles of his bridge preaching? Because we sometimes see that people are trying to build a bridge, but how do we do this so that we're able to still bring people to true Krishna consciousness? And also so that we're still able to remain pure ourselves in our focus on pure devotional service to Krishna, as opposed to getting too much caught up in other things, if that's okay. Well, well your, your spiritual master was also very uh, expert in doing this and propagating it and also teaching the principles that make up successful bridge preaching. And one of the things he said is that, you know, when you're going fishing, you had to make sure you don't fall in. He says, bridge preaching is not something that everybody and anybody can do. One has to be fixed in their own, pro in their own execution of their, the process of devotional service and at the same time, be able to see the connection between the principles of spirituality that is found not only in other spiritual movements, but in secular life itself. Connecting these principles in a gradual way where you bring people from one step to another. In other words, you move them forward towards devotional service. Um, for instance, one of the uh, things of bridge preaching that we do is, you know, we go to yoga ashrams <laughs> and they're interested in mostly Hatha yoga and various types of, maybe pranayama is also mixed in there. But the idea is that, you know, we may also have come from that background. This is where there, there is a slight uh, concern, is that coming out of from a particular background and then doing that type of preaching towards that same people who had, who, who are now practicing what we gave up, we might find ourselves again being attracted to that. So there's the, where's where the danger is. And at the same time, one has to know how to explain, explain the connections that bring it. So the idea is that we are teaching yoga, we're teaching bhakti yoga. So we're saying that when we go into these ashrams, we're teaching also yoga, but a kind of bhakti yoga, which comes in the form of song. So that song is a glorification of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
We use various types of methods such as Govinda Jaya Jaya, Gopala Jaya Jaya, Radha Ramana Hari, Govinda Jaya Jaya, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, various types of, in order to connect people who have an interest in yoga, bringing it a little bit farther beyond the idea of calisthenics, but then again, sometimes the devotees also find themselves uh, becoming attracted to that and start performing <laughs> yoga themselves, which is not necessary. So uh, bridge preaching means, as, as your Guru Maharaj says, you know, to go fishing, but not to fall in the water. <laughs> to use a cliche. <laughs> So it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. If you're not fixed in not only in the philosophy, but in the practice of Krishna consciousness, you may also be, uh, you know, allured away from, I've seen that. I saw that in, when we were in New Vrindavan, we were doing uh, interfaith preaching with many groups from other traditions. And we were holding seminars and programs, inviting key people from various traditions. Uh, some mainstream traditions and others more like new age traditions, both. And so we were bringing these people and we were having, this was done once a month. We were having what they're called interfaith conferences. But I saw how some of the devotees got so attracted to some of these other other uh, processes that they actually not only adopted some of them but actually gave up Krishna consciousness and became members of these other groups. <laughs> and I was also there in New Vrindavan when we were doing some of the activities of some of these other groups saying that it, it'll support our Krishna consciousness. <laughs> And I participated in this too. <laughs> so, and I saw that, and I also saw how uh, people became, because uh, many of these groups are charismatic. And because of that, there is an attraction to their process. And they have a lot of personalism in their presentation, which if it's not there in our, our process, we become a little bit more enamored by that, that and start thinking, well, here people are more together and more personal than we are. So it seems like it, they're more friendly and more open. So there is various traps that one can fall into unless you're really fixed in your own process of Krishna consciousness. And that fixation is not only something that is important to prevent you from being the Lord, but in order to bring them uh, closer or give them a clear understanding of uh, bhakti. That's important. Uh, knowing how to connect the, the different activities in different traditions to the unifying principle of, of devotion. Bhakti Vinodha Kaur was also, he also wrote one article about that. Um, how when he goes to other religious ceremonies and he showed the differences by uh, by language by worship by object of worship there are differences but essentially the principle is the same to worship the supreme personality of godhead so he showed he shows how to unify the differences by understanding your own tradition clearly and seeing the connection in other traditions. And then you don't get bewildered <laughs> or, uh, you know, uh, attracted in the wrong way. Thank, thank you, Mark. I just want to ask a follow-up question based upon what you just said. So you said that sometimes people may be drawn to other groups because as devotees, we may not be so, we may, we may lack personalism. Why, why is that? Why is it sometimes as a community, we as devotees lack some personalism, even though Prabhupada and our teachings are very personal? And what could we do to, to be more personal? 
think maybe that's part of the culture we're coming out of. The uh, Western culture is very impersonal. The only thing you can't say sensuality or sense gratification is the basis for developing personalism. That's another form of exploitation. When people come together based on the idea of sense gratification, it's a form of impersonalism, which is ex exploitative. So when we come, we, when we're coming out of that tradition, we try to somehow or other make that transition. We go the other way, we swing the other way and become less, uh, what's the word? Not less personal, but less open to application of how to apply the principles of our devotion in a very, what we say, loving way. And that, that's why Nectar of Devotion, the verse number four, is very important. It's a, one of the most important verses. The six loving exchanges between devotees, as explained by Rupa Goswami, as Srila Prabhupada says that we have established our ISKCON temple society in order to facilitate these six loving exchanges. That's an a, a exact quote from the purport. So this has to be practiced regularly that we practice these six loving exchanges among devotees. That will help to you know, keep that relationship within the context of the spiritual practice and at the same time uh, open up the more personal relationships between devotees. Mm -hmm. Oh, well maybe we maybe we're a little bit top heavy. We we tend to be like gyanis sometimes instead of bhaktis. <laughs> we're very much into the gyan, <laughs> and sometimes we apply the gyan in a very uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, there's a certain word, dogmatic way. <laughs> and we use the philosophy in order to. Uh, present the knowledge, we lose a little bit of that personal. So Prabhupada actually said, uh, he said, he said, I have a, a mind, the mind of an English army officer and the heart of a Bengali mother. <laughs> so he said, this, this is what we should be like, strong in mind and soft in heart. This is Vaishnava. Sometimes we have a we have the a strong heart and a weak mind. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> so this soft-heartedness is the compassionate nature of a Vaishnava who wants to share Krishna consciousness with others. And it's done in various ways. And these six loving exchanges are foundational by which we build relationships upon. So yeah, we have a uh, transition from our previous training in, uh, in the material world. We're afraid we go from one, we swing from one side to another. It's like sometimes when you get married, uh, you know, you in your marriage your relationship, there has to be affection between husband and wife, but there has to be avoiding sensuality. So affection has to be there, but not, not sensuality as a principle of, you know, bringing about relationships. So there's that division or that balance or that understanding of these principles. How, you know, so what is real love? Real love is to serve in such a way as to benefit the object that we serve based on spiritual principles. <laughs> so we're learning how to love. <laughs> it's part of, you know, and uh, so as our movement first began, we were kind of like, in general, this is a general principle, it's not always there. Prabhupada was quite the opposite, is that we, 
we're learning the philosophy, we were wearing the philosophy more or less as a protection against our own emotions. So we have to filter those emotions through the philosophy in a devotional way. So your Guru Maharaj, when he used to sign his letters, he would always say, with love, your servant, you know. He would always sign it with love. You remember that? Yeah, when he wrote his letters, yeah. He was showing that, yeah, that has to, that, that must be there. <laughs> and on that point, what happens if people don't, don't filter their emotions through the philosophy. So what, because we sometimes see the bullies can, as you said, they can become hard hearted. What, what does that lead to? Hard hearted or sentimental, either one. That's the two, mm -hmm. the two uh, extremes. Because mm -hmm. devotional service is basically emotion, but directed by philosophy or princi spiritual principles. Mm -hmm. It's about loving Krishna and also loving the devotees. But that love is shown on a spiritual platform and not on a sensual platform. There is some sensuality there, but that is spiritual sensuality. It's not based on the desire to satisfy my senses, but the desire to uh, give Krishna consciousness in a way that, you know, is personal. <laughs> it's a very personal movement. The gopis in Vrindavan, they don't talk much about philosophy, but they just love Krishna, that's all. <laughs> it's, complete, it's, it's complete pure spiritual emotion. Not just emotion, but spiritual emotion. So we may not, if we're not so advanced or not so clear, we might mix in material emotions with spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 it's can be very subtle and also very hard to detect unless we are, you know, are really fixed in our practice of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. One very senior devotee in our movement used to say, we are so transcendental, we can't be kind. When dealing with the non-devotees, kindness is one of the best ways to um, develop relationships. Material people are kind to each other, but generally there is a motivation behind it. The devotee's idea of becoming kind to others is that, that that kindness goes to that person, the soul, who is part and parcel of Krishna who has a loving relationship to Krishna. Appreciating the person beyond the body. Mm -hmm. These are some things, I'm not expert in this subject, but I've heard a few things. Thank you so much, Ron. Yeah. I mean, we had to establish a devotee care system in order to bring this about in a more organized way. That came at the beginning of this century. That now, in order to bring about care and concern for devotees, it was systemized and became part of one of the committees of the GBC where it's being practically 
applied in temples and yatras around the world, how to take care of and interact with other devotees in a meaningful way, in, in a way that is beneficial. Mm -hmm. Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Guru Maharaj. I'm just so moved by Buddha Bhavana's question and the ensuing discussion and also Bhakti Tita Maharaj's love that he wanted all of us to share. I just want to share a little bit of my experiences. Uh, I've had several times when I have gone, actually gone and entered a Christian church because one time I didn't have any devotee association and I was longing to have some congregational uh, place of worship. At other times, I was so disillusioned and so hurt by the impersonalism that I was experiencing that I walked into a church on Sunday. Boy, the reception I got. It's like a long lost friend has come back. Ladies would come up to me. They would greet me in the middle. At the intermission, the pastor himself would come down and give me a big beaming smile, give me a card, give us your name, your phone number, your address. Um, are you comfortable? Do you need drink you need this i was treated like royalty when i walked into that church and i said my god no one ever even looks at me or care whether i come into the temple or i don't come into the temple even if i don't come for days on end nobody even asks why where are you what's going on with you in our uh, you know temple some of them i don't say all and i was thinking to myself where is the love where is the compassion? Where is the caring in our communities? And I must say that we have a lot of work to do in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the devotees are, sometimes they feel to be emotionally trapped by this affection that's given that they are, because they can't give it without being uh, pulled into it in the wrong way but that takes you know a clear understanding of who we are as a spiritual being but also our needs um you know on a level of fellowship and friendship i don't know, i mean the bhagavad gita the third to 12th chapter krishna talks about how one who is very friendly to everyone is very dear to him So really at, least, at least at least we could be friendly. <laughs> yes, yes. At, at the very least. At the very least, we can be at least polite and civil and at least make eye contact and smile. Even that is so difficult. So difficult. It's like, wow, people cannot even look at you and smile at you. That's that's sad, actually. I really want to thank Bhutta Bhavna Prabhu for reminding us of Bhakti Tita Maharaj and your holiness also for reminding how Bhakti Tita Maharaj would sign with love, your servant. Even Krishna Nandini was so much in this mood of loving, healthy relationships. She really worked tirelessly to build strong, loving relationships. Yeah, there are many devotees that are in that mood, but as a society, we're still growing into that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Bhutta Bhavna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Um, any more questions or comments? Guru Maharaj, we are past uh, 19 minutes of the hour, so uh, I think there are many. Yeah, I think I'll stop because I have another program coming up in a little while. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll, tomorrow we'll do Gadadhar Pandit, yes, and uh, today we're honoring both of them today as their disappearance day, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Srila Gadadhar Pandit, Goswami. Thank you so much, so, Thank you very much for coming and being part of today's discussion. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay.
Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for your love, for your care, for your concern. It is because of you that I'm still continuing in this con. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. 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 Th